Thank you. Uh, as she said, I'm Fred Beitler, a former deputy historian of the House of Representatives. This is my second time at the forum. Uh, I came actually back in, I think, 2004, a uh, long time ago, but it's also the second time I've been in Poland. I was here in 1981, the summer of solidarity, if those of you know back then. Uh, and that has affected in some ways what I've looked at, how the understanding of, of mediating institutions, that union, as well as the church here in Poland during the time of, of communism. Uh, the talk I have today is called Religious Freedom and Foreign Affairs, the History and Development of an Act of Congress, the American Congress, called the International Religious Freedom Act. Uh, and what this does is internationalize the First Amendment, the American First Amendment of the Constitution. And so you're going to get some American history, uh, some American legislative history, but I think this is one of the most exciting things because it's so heavily influenced by the church, by Christians. And so I want us to consider that one of the most important events that changed world history took place in the American state of Virginia in the 1780s. That's something that I really want us to think about because that affects every single person who are here in this room and also gives us an incredible opportunity to explain what we are as the church. The difference between impose and propose. Uh, we want to think about this because the understanding of religious freedom invented in many ways in Virginia in the 1780s, about 225 years ago, uh, was the first time ever that a state, an institution, had proclaimed as official government policy that it would promote the positive doctrine of religious freedom. It enabled that situation, as St. Ambrose said, to propose rather than impose, because all throughout history, up until the 1780s, governments imposed ideas, imposed faith or official doctrine. And Ambrose was saying it as a minority, not under state power, but by the, 14, by the 470s, for a thousand years, Christians did impose in Christendom. And I want us to see that possibility again in the 1780s that enabled us to say, no, we're not to impose as state organs in requiring certain kinds of belief. Instead, we voluntarily propose. So I want us to think about that. While there had been policies of religious toleration before, religious freedom is qualitatively different in that it transforms the relationship between official doctrines of truth, whatever that is, and the civil order. It is the political expression of Jesus' command to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So I'm going to open up and feel free to sort of call on, raise hands, uh, ask questions. And I'm going to call a little bit on you. But, uh, and feel free to stop me if you, you have dissenting opinions, right? Uh, but I want us to really consider what this piece of legislation and the, the roots of it and how it works its way through to give us the opportunity for us to be here today. Because questions of unity among different believers is really important that us as evangelicals as a worldwide movement, but also it comes out of a very distinctively Western but primarily an American context. And those of you from a European perspective uh, will have a chance to, to uh, uh, question uh, my, my uh, perhaps my American-centric view. Uh, but we can sort of uh, talk about that as we go through. So internationalizing the First Amendment. We'll talk about this and I'll give you at least some background as to what this means. Uh, because I want us to sort of go through in the American context and how that goes out to a current doctrine that is part of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, uh, but also one that will affect and provide a certain kind of resources as we as Christians understand how we interact with state power. So the Christian origins of religious freedom. We all understand that significant phrase that Jesus does, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. But we really don't think of what that means because what this does is develop a separation of truth from power. 
And this hadn't been done before, before Jesus said this. It's one of the most radical things in a worldly context, one of the most radical things that Jesus ever said. And I sort of see the, the uh, uh, phrase there and also the denarius, right? Uh, many of things that Jesus does that Holy Week, why did, for example, he overturn the tables uh, of the money changers in the temple? Well, of course, to pay your temple tax, you can't have an image of a divine God that is a challenge to the Christian God or the, the Jewish God in the temple. That's one of the things that Jesus does. It's one of the things that leads to that process of Holy Week, to his crucifixion. So we want to see those events of that week, but also what Jesus says. The difference between what our duty is to Caesar and what our duty is to God. Uh, but I want us to think about that difference. And one of the things I think that is critical to understand is who is granting toleration. It affects state power, right? The state controlling an understanding of an official truth claim is one that says, I will tolerate your difference. Uh, but religious freedom is quite a bit different because it follows what Jesus says in saying that my understanding of truth is not dependent upon state power. In fact, it comes from God. There is a very clear role for the state, understandably. But there's something that's different in a grant of religious freedom. So I, I want us to think about it, and I'm not putting you on the spot, but I want us to really think about the implications of what this means. And those of you who are involved as public servants or in the process of preparation for public servants, to understand exactly what that means and how we can further that understanding of what religious freedom is, because it is something that is under severe attack, I would suggest, in this day and age in many countries that we, we uh, uh, some of us may be even here. Uh, or very close by. And so I want us to see how we as Christians can move towards that uh, uh, experience that we are not imposing a specific understanding, but rather proposing in the voluntary sense. So a difference between toleration and freedom. Uh, the Enlightenment philosopher John Locke does have a very important argument towards religious toleration. And those of you from the UK understand very clearly in his letters of toleration. But that is a grant of the state to provide a space for minority views to, to think as they choose, right? Uh, Rome did that as well. And if you remember what, what Eben, uh, Edward Gibbon uh, said about the first century understanding of religion, right? The people believed that every religion was true. The philosophers believed that every religion was false and the magistrates believed every religion was useful. Uh, and so we want to think about how that uh, works as we try to explain and propose the truth about our Christian faith. So talk about uh, American context. An Enlightenment philosopher and thinker, Thomas Jefferson, uh, does pen some very significant words in the American Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among them are life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, this is a, in many ways, a creedal statement, uh, arguing that the understanding of rights, human rights, are not based on a grant from the state, but rather are given to us by God. Uh, and Jefferson is a deist, uh, believing in nature and nature's God, not a, not a Christian, but understands this granting of rights that is outside of the state given to us by God, rights of equality, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that deeply affects an American context. Now, Jefferson had three things that he wanted to be remembered for. Uh, and this is his tombstone out in Virginia. Uh, he was the author of the Declaration of American Independence. The second thing, he was the author of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom. And the third, the father of the University of Virginia. He didn't really care about being president, that wasn't all that important to him. Uh, but these are the three that he sees as significant. And we could talk about in the future and maybe uh, look at the understanding of what a university is, because this is an international institution as well, a European invention that spread worldwide and has also distinctive understandings of what academic freedom is, in some ways deriving from this understanding of what the creator gives us. Uh, is 
people made in his image. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about that Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom because this does start a revolution in church and state. So what Jefferson is going to do uh, is propose this, and I'll read a, a, a part, and I want us to sort of think about what he's doing. Whereas Almighty God hath created the mind free, and that all attempts to influence it by temporal punishments or burdens, or by civil incapacitations, tend only to beget happiness, habits of hypocrisy and meanness, and are departures from the plan of the holy author of our religion, that to compel a man to furnish contributions of money for the propagation of opinions which he disbelieves is sinful and tyrannical. Huh, okay, let's think about that in that context. Every country on earth at that point was imposing an official doctrine, and that's what education in many ways means. We want to make sure that we, the, the state wants to make sure that it will raise people to understand the legitimacy of its state. It's a very clear function. But Jefferson is saying, wait a second, there's something that God has given us, making the mind free, that to compel, coerce, to support something in disbelief is sinful and tyrannical. He'll go on to say, therefore, be enacted by the General Assembly of the Dominion of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, that no man shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship, but that all men shall be free to profess and by argument to maintain their opinion in matters of religion. Now, what are American values? And that's something that I want us to, to think about. And, and we put them on our money. Yeah, what are American values? Well, so we put them on our money, and those of you who know Americans will probably say our values is the money, right? Uh, but, but instead, we actually have a few things. Liberty, e pluribus unum, from many one. And then in God we trust, which is our official national motto. So you see it on the dollar bill, for example. We also have a symbol here, the Novus Ordo Seclorum a new order for the ages. And I would argue that that positive doctrine of religious freedom is that new order for the ages. Uh, but those of us who understand how governments work, right, in God we trust, we get the understanding of, of what that means. And, and as many, you'll occasionally see a sign on an American store, in God we trust, all others pay cash. Uh, and we understand sort of how that means and kind of a, a cynical understanding. Uh, but we want to understand think about what government means. And so even though in the American context recently uh, there has been a deep suspicion of questions of religious liberty, uh, and that's a context that's quite a bit different than it was even 10 years ago. Uh, religious liberty is seen as maybe preferring uh, a certain kind of religious vision or religious domination, and it's under assault in the United States. Uh, but I want us to affirm that we still have that vision that Americans say that their state is under God, uh, something very important in our founding documents. Now, what does God in God we trust mean? And there is two different, not two different, but two slightly different strands in the New Testament, Christian teaching on what we're to do. Romans 13, we all understand that. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Now, the United States is founded on revolution, and one wants to see that certain arguments in the American context is that revolution is uh, in some ways justified uh, in certain ways, that there is a right of revolution. Some of it will come out of the Enlightenment context of individuals like John Locke, but there's a very strong element that it comes out of figures, theologians like John Calvin and then John Knox. Uh, and it's not the place here to go into that, but I want us to see that there are two strains. An Enlightenment strain, people like Locke and Jefferson, but also a very strong Baptist strain or Pietist strain that quotes, Peter, we must obey God rather than men. Those two contrasting or, or arguments in tension all coming out of Jesus' doctrine, we must obey or, or render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, to God the things that are God's. Certain things are the things are Caesar's, right? And Jesus very clearly says that. But there are also things that are God's. Uh, the state usually wants to see itself as God. And Rome had done that, even divinizing. Uh, the emperor, and that is something that Christians 
were persecuted for because they didn't burn incense, just kind of a tipping the hat to the emperor. They refused to do that. Uh, and thus the persecutions during the early years, up until the fourth century, uh, up until uh, Constantine. So think about those two sort of doctrines. Now this revolution of church and state does come out of the Ref reformation of specifically Baptists, a Baptist understanding of what the church is and the church function. Baptists are not going to be one. We don't have to talk about the difference, but we can think about it, the difference between infant baptism and adult baptism. Infant ba baptism welcome you into the civil order, right, as well as welcome you into the religious order in a established church context. Well, the Baptists refused to do that, persecuted during the Reformation. But there's a couple key figures. One is Roger Williams, who talks about the first time we see this expression, the wall of separation between the garden of the church and the wilderness of the world. Uh, Isaac Bacchus, a Baptist minister, who actually was on the, the uh, ratifying convention of the, the Constitution of Baptist, say, how came a civil community by any ecclesiastical power? How came the kingdoms of this world to have a right to govern in Christ's kingdom, which is not of this world? That dissenting Baptist tradition, combined with the Enlightenment deist tradition, leads to that revolution in church and state. And if you're thinking about how to create or develop a coalition to get legislation passed. That's how in the state of Virginia that had an official Anglican church, Enlightenment figures like Jefferson along with the Baptists are the ones to develop that legislative majority to get something like that passed. So we're going to think about that shrewdness. Uh, James Madison, uh, one of the, the really engineers behind the legislative campaign to get that uh, Virginia's bill to establish religious freedom uh, actually argues for it. The religion then of every man must be left to the conviction and conscience of every man, and it's the right of every man to exercise it as it may dictate. I want you to think about that because it changes the understanding of the nature of the church. Because notice what we're doing, and we're going to come back to this, but notice what it does. What do we see the church as? In a European context, uh, you see it as a corporate body, right? We see it as the body of Christ, as something that is not a mere aggregate of individuals. But in the American context, you're thinking that it is of opinion and based on the individual. And there's a very strong strain of individualism in the American context and this particular understanding that influences what it means to be a Christian. Are we, as a church, an aggregate of individuals? Or are we, in some sense, this body of Christ, a corporate entity? Well, let's think about that, and we'll, we'll come back to that. But I want us to see that this piece of legislation, combined as an Enlightenment, really tolerant position, combined with a Baptist dissenting tradition from evangelical pietists, that coalition enables this bill to pass. And so to carry it up for, towards the end of that decade, the American Constitution, uh, we're not going to talk too much about it, uh, but its First Amendment does have these critical words. Congress, the American Congress, the federal body, shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Two parts. The establishment of religion, that is the state support of religion through tax dollars, and the second is prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So this is an American understanding of the relationship between religion and state power, or I would push the understanding of the relationship between power and truth claims. Okay, let's think about what that means. So what does this do? What is that relationship? It makes religion no longer imposed it develops a voluntary principle. Religion now becomes a choice. You're not born into it. And, and to think about it as, as we look at us as, as, as Christians, uh, it's sometimes very easy, and we'll, we'll play. We're in Poland, we can do this, uh, right? Uh, in the American context, if you are Roman Catholic, you can always say, if you're challenged on your political opinion, well, I'm Catholic, and everybody assumes, oh, you're born into that community, and thus you are, have this doctrine that you are uh, part of. But you're basically born into that. 
what does it mean to be an evangelical? One of the hostility that we face as evangelicals is precisely because we as adults freely choose to believe these things. Think about that. You can, and, and notice as you, you, you listen to people saying, oh, I believe this because I'm part of a larger organization, whereas I freely choose to believe it because I understand it's true. So questions of the nature of when does life begin? Question the issues of abortion, for example, or marriage, for example. Uh, the evangelical is seen as one who is immediately suspect in a very hostile environment because we choose that. Uh, to me, I think that's very exciting, but we have to understand what that means. The world looks at those who are born in, say, a community. Oh, you believe that because you're born there. Uh, the evangelical is like, wait, you're an adult? You, you chose that? Uh, yes, and so we have to provide reasons for that. Uh, but that's something that if this does. Religion now is voluntary. It's a choice. Uh, it also means that the state is limited. There are things that the state recognizes that are of God's and not of the state. Notice how this sort of puts in Jesus' words, render to Caesar, render to God. That's there. It also has a suspicion of official truth claims. I remember talking about this to, to a German uh, once, and we were arguing between whether German, uh, Germany, now the, the, the German state, was more democratic or the American uh, state was more democratic. And, and she got very frustrated, and she said, well, you, you Americans, you, you can't be really democratic. Germans are far more democratic because we trust our government. And, and I just laughed, right? Because an American is deeply suspicious of official truth claims. Uh, we are skeptical because we understand there's a place for Caesar, but also a place for God. So these difference. We move from church, in looking at sociological terms, church with a capital C, imposed by the state, supported by taxes. The sect, the church sect distinction, we remember the Reformation, right? Uh, the Catholic Church or the Lutheran Church, for example, supported by taxation, the sect outside. Now, in the American context and now worldwide, you invent something that is a denomination so that a Baptist and a Lutheran and a Presbyterian understand that, yes, we believe similar things, but we disagree on others, but we understand that you are also faithful believers in God. We may disagree on a few things, but now we have that possibility of unity, not imposed, not sort of us against the world, but rather unity of fellow believers of evangelicals, right? A theological understanding. Uh, and then we also, this does institutional pluralism. It allows for the existence of corporate bodies, right? Of corporations, bodies that are outside of the state. So does this make religion private? If one understands the context of the post, or the, the French context, uh, that says the difference between church and state is this is private, that is public. No, uh, the American doctrine, that revolution in church and state, creates a large public sphere outside of government. State and church does not mean public and private, but rather public in non-governmental. So a private university or a private school has a public function. And because of that, needs to be supported as institutional pluralism. Anyone who thinks about the idea, anybody who works for a non-governmental organization, when you think about that idea, that is the doctrine that enables this. I, to me, it is just exciting to see that whole space outside of government, but that has a public function. And this is the justification for it, or I would argue it is. A couple things that are slightly different in context. Uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, has an understanding of what he calls a public religion, whereas Jean-Jacques Rousseau, that French Enlightenment philosopher, uh, has an understanding of civil religion. And I want us to see the difference, what that means. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but public religion is kind of an ordering faith. Not saving faith. Saving faith exists, but it's concerned with the res publica, an underlying moral and spiritual consensus of the whole people. Not something that is, uh, it, it enables different understandings of personal salvation within it. Franklin's public religion is a broad agreement of how to get along in a commonwealth. That religion as binding, right? That 
sociological binding function, but it's limited. It's uh, uh, self-limited. Uh, agreement on how to get along in a commonwealth rather than the very truth about existence, which is left to individual faiths. It's an understanding of government as limited. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, if you look at his social contract uh, from 1762, right at the end, he'll talk about a doctrine of civil religion. And he wants to go back to the idea of the virtue of Sparta, for example, or the virtue of the Roman Republic. And one of the things that he sees is the significant problem is the nature of Christianity. Christianity gives men two codes of legislation, two rulers, two countries, render them subject to contradictory duties and makes it impossible to be faithful both to religion and citizenship. 30 years later, what does the French Revolution does, do? It abolishes Christianity within France. And that conflict, a French understanding that church is private and in fact needs to be crushed, as Voltaire would say. Uh, that's where this comes from, that understanding of a unitary sovereignty uh, going back to the Roman Republic. And it comes out of Rousseau. It's a very different sort of notion of what it means to understand the place of Christianity in the role of the state. So this is something that is on the doorway of within the US Capitol in the House of Representatives. It's something that I've always loved as a, a statement that expresses an American understanding. And through that, in many ways, to the world. Man is not made for the state, but the state for man, and derives its just powers only from the consent of the governed. Now, let's move from the 1780s and the 1790s in the American context worldwide. Uh, because we want to see what the United States does in moving outside of its own context as it becomes a world power. One well, of the first things you have to look at is the American President Woodrow Wilson. We are in Poland. One of the things that Woodrow Wilson wanted to do as the Americans got involved in the First World War, the Great War, is to create a Polish state. That was one of his 14 points. Much of Eastern Europe is shaped by that. But as he says, we want the world to be made safe for democracy. And he talks about a vision of a league of nations as well as national self-determination that moves the United States within a global context. Now, skip ahead to the American President Franklin Roosevelt. Speaking in before American entry into the Second World War, uh, but while the European War is going on. At this point, Nazi Germany is allied with the Soviet Union, which we often forget. Uh, and the American President Franklin Roosevelt said, to look at what this nature of the world crisis is, we have to preserve four specific freedoms. Freedom of speech, speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is the freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, and the fourth is freedom from fear. And an American artist captured these, these four freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. Uh, those are the things that they understand created that world con uh, the crisis that led to the Second World War. Out of that vision, out of that, that crisis, uh, developed the United Nations and also the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And here you see uh, the widow, uh, after President Roosevelt died, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was on the chair of the drafting committee of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. And one of the things, one of the most important clauses within that, and here's the, the declaration, um, was authored by one of the people on the committee, uh, the philosopher from Lebanon, an Orthodox Christian, Greek Orthodox Christian, by the name of Charles Malik. He's the one to draft Article 18. And I'll talk about that, but he's got this vision of intermediate institutions, the church, a corporate body, outside of the state. Um, well, go into all of this, but uh, intermediate institutions between in state and the individual are the real sources of our freedoms and rights. Uh, power, legitimate power, outside of the state. And here, if you will, is Article 18. Uh, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief. Think of what that means. 
This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom, either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest his to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. This is the internationalization of that vision of religious freedom that comes out of the Virginia Declaration and of the First Amendment. You can see it here, it's, sorry, it's a little blurry, but uh, those of you understand what the, the significance of Article 18 is. Uh, if we look at the speech this morning, most of the original uh, signatories of the United Nations agreed with this. The Muslim states did not. They refused to accept the notion of freedom to change one's religion or belief. So US foreign policy and human rights. Uh, how does this move into a international context? In the 1970s, actually 1977, the American President Jimmy Carter said, as a policy of human rights is American foreign policy. We have reaffirmed America's commitment to human rights as a fundamental tenet of our foreign policy. What draws us together, perhaps more than anything else, is a belief in human freedom. Now I'm coming to the International Religious Freedom Act, passed 20 years ago, uh, actually, 21 years ago, in 1998, uh, and passed by the American Congress, passed by a bipartisan coalition, actually was passed unanimously in both the Senate and the House and signed by the President. Um, and here we see some issues. And if we want to go back and take a look, right above, this is where the, the, uh, the Speaker of the House and the uh, uh, Vice President sits, and right above here of the dais is that motto, in God we trust, uh, to remind us of where our rights come from as people. Now, this is the uh, original legislation, and we're not going to go through the whole legislation, but what it does is something that I think is, is fascinating. Uh, it has the, act, the, International, the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998, and it requires the State Department, the U.S. State Department, uh, to do certain things. Uh, but it also doesn't trust the State Department, uh, which I think is just marvelous. It sets up something outside, a Commission on International Religious Freedom. And so what the International Religious Freedom Act, it should be the policy of the United States to condemn violations of religious freedom and to promote and to assist other governments in the promotion of the fundamental right to freedom of religion. The United States is the only government on earth <laughs> that has made the promotion of religious freedom as part of its foreign policy. That is, to me, exciting. The Vatican has the freedom of the church as part of its foreign policy. And there's a slight difference that I want to think of us as, as we come together and try to think about how we can combine an individual right, an individual freedom, with a corporate freedom. So I'm not going to go into to the legislation. It's a very shrewd process. And, and I, uh, I'm going to call somebody out. Emily. Who's Emily? Yeah. Emily. Emily works for a non-governmental organization. So since this is the 20th anniversary, I've got another copy. And, and uh, I, I'll, I'll show it. It's on my uh, uh, the WhatsApp. Uh, but I wanted to do because you work for a, an NGO, right? Yeah. Yes. And this is, this is the doctrine that, that sort of enables uh, NGOs to exist worldwide, which I, I think is exciting. Anyway, I won't go into the, the whole uh, intricacies of the legislation, um, but what it does is have, this is the official State Department, and it this, the act requires the State Department to have every year a report on international religious freedom of every country worldwide. Just think about that. That's kind of, I mean, arrogance from the Americans, uh, but it's also something that really comes out of a belief that Religious freedom is the first liberty, and those states that protect religious freedom will protect other freedom for the individual. That, that fundamental right of understanding what one's relationship with God is. I'm going to take five more minutes for, for this, and then we can open up for Q&A. Uh, that fundamental freedom, others flow out of there, right? Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of relationships, of marriage, et cetera, comes out of one's understanding of one's relationship before God. So the State Department uh, has a requirement to have a international religious freedom report. Uh, the State Department, as the, legislation, as the legislation was working, what's 
way through, fought it tooth and nail. They didn't want it, and the bureaucracy within the diplomatic community in the United States didn't want this at all. But once it took place, okay, they'll reluctantly do it. Uh, what the legislation and its brilliance did is not just have an executive branch, but an external check that's here. And these are the websites, a US Commission on International Religious Freedom that is funded by the government, but it is a independent outside of the bureaucracy as a check with on it. And it will do an annual report as well singling out, well, I'll, I'll say it, the, international, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom is an independent, bipartisan U.S. federal government commission, the first of its kind in the world, dedicated to defending the universal right of freedom of religion or belief abroad. It checks the State Department. It checks the federal government as something outside, that two-part position. And what it does, and, and there's a few documents here that you can sort of pick up on the, uh, on the table up front, uh, but this is the most recent report. Uh, I went back a couple, uh, actually a week ago before I came, and the State Department is slow. Their most recent uh, report is from two years ago. Uh, the International Religious Freedom Commission report is right up to date. Uh, this just came out about, three, about two weeks ago. Uh, and it's interesting to see a demonstrator is wearing a mask painted with the colors of the, the flag of East Turkestan and a hand bearing the colors of the Chinese flag attending the protests of the supporters of the Muslim Uyghur minority. If you understand what's taking place uh, in, in China and the oppression of Muslims uh, within China as the Chinese government is coercing every institution outside the control of the Communist Party to be re-educated within. That's an imposing official understanding of what uh, power is because uh, the Chinese is not allowing the existence of corporate bodies outside of its control. Uh, we don't understand the persecution of the church within China. Um, but the understanding of religious freedom is not a Christian doctrine. It is one that is inherent in the dignity of each individual person. Uh, it will focus the, the uh, will call out specific, what I'll call countries of particular concern. Russia is one, for example. And it will suggest, and you can see the countries of particular concern that are restricting religious freedom worldwide. And this does this every year. And it's a resource for those of you uh, outside of the United States to understand that here is something that you can use leverage based on a United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that Article 18. This is a resource that everybody in the world can use, which I think is, is fascinating as we go. Here is the specific issue on Russia. Russia, during 2018, accelerated the repressive behavior that led the commission to recommend its dedication, de designation as a country of particular concern. And this has some real teeth in it. Um, one of the individuals, uh, a really faithful Christian statesman and evangelical, uh, behind this legislation was uh, the American congressman by the name of Frank Wolf. Uh, defending human rights, a giving of voice to the voiceless, has long been his priority. Uh, he was in Congress for 32 years, and this was his central most important thing that he was able to do uh, to lead to this passage. And that dual setup of both federal government, official state, but also that outside check on this. My faith teaches that to whom much is given, much is required. We remember Luke 24, 48. And that is something that we are commanded to do. And we're, we're judged on that as believers in the public square. Now, what is the legacy of this International Religious Freedom Act 20 years later? I, I talked with, with Charlie uh, 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 last night. I had a chance to meet with him because he's working on the British context through the House of Lords, right? Uh, the Foreign Secretary. Oh, the Foreign Secretary, okay. Uh, um, through the Foreign Secretary to get the British government to understand that they need to also consider questions of religious persecution worldwide. That's part of its legacy. Um, a number of other things too as well, and I, I won't go through all things, um, but one of the things that Frank Wolf said is quite simply, our conscience is not ultimately allegiant to the state, but to something and for many people, someone higher. Uh, 
right? That is something that as a Christian statesman who put in this legislation, something that really has an impact. Uh, that is one sort of public servant that he really, um, and, and I've had a chance to meet with, with uh, uh, Congressman Wolf and, and understand what drives him because he was one of the first Americans to reach out, for example, to places like Darfur. Uh, um, and so the legacy after 20 years, the document that you may want to think about of how in the relation of politics to society, faithful Christians can work out an understanding of Jesus' vision of how we render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And I want us to think about with us as evangelicals who are now in different denominations but sharing one faith united in that, uh, that we can find a way to combine liberty of conscience for the individual with freedom of the church as a corporate body. Those two things that really is, as the chaplain to the U.S. House of Representatives said, that the understanding of religious freedom is America's gift to the world.